It's actually a problem with us with how much fruit we have got. Incredible amounts of banana. But there's too many plants. Easy way of reducing cost in your food forest. It's probably not traditional centripetal. What we're doing is we're just planting enough. Banana grass being closer to your main tree line is going to be more advantageous. To be able to select the ones that we want, the really healthy plants, the really vigorous plants. But the idea is we're not spending. The ultimate cost of this row was maybe like what under? With the scale and the amount of systems we have here. All of the biomass will be coming from within a meter of each side of that tree line. Retrofitted a market garden into an agroforestry system, an orchard, bare land, bare slope, previously impacted fire areas, native bush that's early succession. So you guys are really pioneering in a lot of different ways. Very inspirational. Getting hungry. Let's go eat. <laughs> <laughs> Let's find some bananas. <laughs> so we're at Wilderland. I'm with Sean and we have just run a weekend long Centropic food forest course. It was fantastic. We did an amazing install. And so this is a great opportunity because they have so many established Centropic systems here that have been installed over the last few years. And so it'd be a great opportunity to share those Centropic systems with you guys, explore them in a little bit in depth, get a little bit of history about them from Sean, some insights, and then we'll explore the new install that we just did over the weekend. So check it out. So we're a living and learning center, an education center, like an experimental playground. Awesome way of describing it. What's been the driving force of adding Centropic? Because obviously there's been gardens here, there's all sorts of accommodations, there's yeah. dwellings, because it's a community, right? It's a community space for living and learning. but What's been that push into Centropic Agroforestry for you guys? Yeah, I guess it's the uh, the, the long-lived systems, uh, trying to create things that are going to you know, produce food for many, many years to come. Creating food systems that uh, integrate people into them, so you know, using, using humans to manage them. And yeah, really just a great way of uh, experimenting and playing with, with growing systems and you know, teaching people that, that come and visit. For those who aren't maybe familiar with Wilderland, I think it's one of the oldest communities in New Zealand that's 60 almost 60 years old yeah over 60 years old and obviously different <clears throat> cycles of people come through and kind of add their flavors into yep. it at the moment the flavor is you know centropic agroforestry yep. and like you're saying it's you know human integrated food systems mm -hmm. into the future long lived yeah cool do you want to explore some of what we're looking at here hell yeah let's have a look at yeah. let's get into it cool now run us through how old a lot of these systems are yeah, so this was uh, about two years ago, I think we put this installation in. Um, we came across a bunch of bananas, so we've got lot, lots and lots of bananas. So yeah, we put the, the system in mainly with bananas and whatever support species we had at the time, which wasn't, wasn't too much. Uh, and slowly we've been adding some of the tithonias in and banana grass and some sugar canes. Um, but yeah, this is yeah what we're looking at about yeah, two years and managing it slowly and doing retrofits to it. Um, yeah, it used to be an old, old uh, annuals sort of uh, garden, and yeah, we just weren't getting the results that we wanted, and we thought, well, hell, let's let's put it into some tropics and see what happens. Awesome. I love that attitude that you guys have about let's just see what happens. It's experimental, yeah. it's playful. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Do you find that's quite a valuable part of like you talk a lot about non-attachment? Right? Is that yeah. kind of what what you mean by that in terms of like you know finding success isn't necessarily having the perfect agroforestry system as much as learning. Exactly that, yeah, exactly that. So yeah, just, we've got a lot of space so we can play. Um, we can install systems, people can come here and they can they can say, are oh, they interested? And yeah, give them a space, install the system. It doesn't have to be perfect, you know, it just, it is what it is. And uh, we learn from every install we do, so yeah. So you welcome people to come into the land, experiment, learn, manage. Yeah, definitely encourage it. Fantastic. So anybody who's out there who wants to learn more about and specifically the hands-on Centropic Agroforestry stuff here in New Zealand, this might be your place. Yeah, welcome. Wonderful. Poplars in here that we're putting in as the drivers of the emergence. Tamarillo underneath the Pithonia over here. We've got uh, Tullows in here. Um, but as you can see, we've also got lots of space, you know, for, for so many more things. So yeah, we're, we're considering putting more in here as, as we get more planting material, we're putting that in here. So we've got a few uh, things in the ground like mint, um, we've got Byron's favorite over here, the uh, false carver. <laughs> to um, me it smells like latex doctor's gloves, no thanks. Uh, this is, I mean, this is beautiful to see. This is a, a cherimoya, you know, put in two years ago from seed. So, I mean, that's just fantastic growth you can see there. That's, right. the, that's exemplar. That's exactly what you're looking for. Yeah, exactly. We've just come from this weekend-long educational workshop where we had 13 
eager students, eager people here who were wanting to learn. One of the themes we noticed in a lot of these systems was the opportunity for intervention and continuing to add more diversity. What kind of things we can continue to add in here? Because obviously there's an established canopy, we've got the long-term species, but what we're noticing is there's a lot of space in here we can continue adding more diversity of long-term species, the yeah. opportunity for big resets with perennial vegetables. Seeing one of the systems we're going to later on is a really big gap between the, the high or the emergent and the low. So that's that's really the gap that we're looking to fill in these systems. Um, we, we had you know we had quite a few of those things when we installed and I guess it's it's probably not traditional centripy where one does the full install in one go, you know, but we've got what we've got and we're doing what we're dealing. And yeah, so it's now it's about filling that that mid mid strata really, you know, and, and a lot of the low as well because we can still let the light in, we can still do the resets, we can take the bananas out uh, without having too much effect on the, the longer term to implants in here, so yeah. And what you said is really interesting about the idea that you don't necessarily need to plant everything at once. I mean, even in these examples, you said that you didn't have any of the real support species until the last, what, six months? Yeah, pretty much, yeah. So a lot of these species, you know, including the Mexican sunflower, a lot of these systems didn't have these early succession herbaceous biomass species, which now, if you look down, you can kind of like see, you can move all the organic material and see there's a healthy amount of organic material on the forest floor, but Obviously, you don't need to start with all the species right away. It will help if you have if you're starting with those early succession pioneers, but it's not absolutely necessary that you start with everything all at once. On this side as well, you can see we've got some, you know, a little bit, a little bit more density. We've got some sorrel in there, and uh, I mean the yakons in the system over there. Uh, but yeah, it, it really, really, we can put a lot more diversity in here, and a, and a lot more. Um, uh, Sort of concentration of plants as well. There's, you know, there's lots of spaces uh, where we can put stuff in. So yeah. What's been something that you guys are having? You're finding a lot of success and and almost joy out of that you're seeing. That it's like, wow, that works really well for us here. Um, well, the poplars were added in <clears throat> later, and yeah, they're just they're just shooting out fantastically. Just you know, really, really lifting the canopy up, and obviously creating a lot of biomass at the same time. A lot of the carbon which we can put into the system which is great. I mean, the banner grass is, is working fantastically. Since we've added that into the system, it's just made such a difference, you know, such rapid growth. And even in here, you can just have a look, there's, there's some gaps in, in some of the rows. So yeah, I think I'll be, I'll be putting in tithonias right into the middle here. So there's, there's lots of sunlight that, you know, can catch that. Maybe even do like sort of support species only systems in here. It's an idea that I've been playing with is just entire lines of just Mexican sunflower to support the rows. Mm. So this is a really exciting place to be standing because yesterday it looked very, very different. We had 13 people in here wielding machetes, rice knives, and chopping and dropping. So this used to be way more overgrown. It was a lot more dense. I think we have some footage of what it looked like before. And now, check this out. Look at how much organic material is on the ground, covering the plants, protecting the soil, how much more sunlight is coming down. It was a really fantastic hands-on activity for the people at the workshop. That's what we find is people really need the hands-on learning to let things sink in. So that's something that has been fantastic about Wilderland, especially is because they have a diversity of systems. And so the opportunity for observing a number of different kinds of systems, the unique characteristics of each one, we can kind of pick things apart, but also have the opportunity to, to get some really hands-on management for the people who are trying to learn this stuff, because that's where most of the learning happens. And so that was a fantastic thing from yesterday. I think yeah, yeah. people got a lot of value out of. Yeah, it was it was quite challenging for me not not to do the intervention uh, when when I saw it was necessary. But yeah, we, we waited for the people to come so they can have the opportunities to to get their hands and the machetes and their rice and hopes in it. Yeah, very grateful. Let's just dig through some of this organic material and just see how much how much is there. Can you just? Like, And look at that. There's a beautiful amount of organic material supporting these these figs, the sugar cane, these bananas. And now, remember, all these bananas are roughly the same age. Is that right, Sean? These yeah, are... uh, yeah, throughout all the bananas you'll see, yeah, we all, all put them in around, around about the same time, about two years ago. Yeah, yeah inter interesting to see the difference between that system and the system here, how, you know, the size of the banana. Yeah. Mm. What do you think is maybe part of Part of the reason for that yeah i think uh this system in particular we have a lot of water runoff on this road which which comes into here um 
and soaks down into the system, whereas that last system was one a bit of a ridge, so I think the water's running on both sides of it. Uh, Man, water makes a huge difference. Huge difference, man, yeah. It's just yeah, being able to access the water around you, direct it towards your systems, yeah, makes it makes a big difference. Um, and I think we had a lot, there's a lot more biomass uh, in the system, a lot of supports, a lot more support species in the planting of it, which made a huge difference. Because yesterday a big management was a lot of the Mexican sunflower that was previously on the outside edges of the, these two rows, these three rows of bananas, that Mexican sunflower would have been added in the last, in the last year. Yeah, so we've, we've already done two or three chop and drops on that already. Yeah, so that's that's definitely added a lot more biomass. And we've also got this bamboo right right next to it. Uh, so I do I do grab some bamboo from there and, and put it into here, um, generally through a chipper. Um, so that's also helped helped add more biomass into it. Mm. Yeah. It's a fantastic resource to look at what organic material is already around the existing or the newly establishing system. Yeah, yeah and um, so these figs that you see in here, they were just stuck in here by stake from the, the fig tree that's over there, and you know, I've just been sticking them in as I'm putting the system in, and yeah, it's such a you know that's beautiful growth there. I mean, you know, we, we're, we're obviously struggling with a bit of fungus or something here in the system, but strangely enough, I mean, if you look at this inside the system, how this fig looks compared to the original where it comes from, you know, the, the original's got no more leaves on it. It's totally been taken up by the fungus this year, and this one seems to be doing better. So that's that's actually really interesting to see, you know. So. I guess the biodiversity in the system, just getting space between the trees and um, yeah, just less, less effect on it. So interesting. interesting. So maybe if there's a tree that looks like it's on its way out, maybe you go propagate it and plant it in some agroforestry systems to keep it healthy and keep it alive in a different way. Yeah, so this is some uh, some of the earlier bunny grass that I planted. Um, as you see, there's, there's none on this side. I think it's mostly sugarcane in here. Yeah, mostly sugarcane on this side, uh, and because I only got the banner grass quite late into the, um, you know, put, putting the systems in, this is some of the early places I put it. So I've been I've been getting into this banner grass as sort of a mother plant and, and propagating with it. So this isn't even, you know, this isn't even all of it. I've literally been taking away the, the thicker canes to propagate, and this is just the leftover stuff. So this is just fantastic. You can see how much, how much. Um, Biomass is coming just from these small little clumps of banner grass. So yeah, I can imagine once the once the banner grass is planted along both sides of all the systems, and the amount of biomass is going to produce is fantastic. So yeah, big ups to the to the banner grass for sure. One of my favorite characteristics about the banner grass compared to the Mexican sunflower is the difference in growth habit, which makes a difference in the management structure. You don't have to be managing it as frequently as Mexican sunflower if you're planting it in the same proximity to your fruit trees, right? Because bonnet grass has a very straight up columnar growth habit. It's never gonna really overshadow in the same way that Mexican sunflower will. So if you're planting a system that you might need to be able to step away from for four months at a time, bonnet grass being closer to your main tree line is gonna be more advantageous rather than having Mexican sunflower right next to your tree line, which will likely overshade and over overshadow things. And the amount of material it produces is just you know, like Shauna said, ridiculous. We've got three different systems here almost. I mean, you know, it's all going to be one for sure. It's all one one forest eventually. Learning on top of, of the things we've done. So yeah, on this side here, you can see this is the initial systems we put in and lots of space, you know, a couple of sugar canes planted in the middle, in the tree row with some figs and taros and really, really not that much density of planting. And then we move on to this system over here, and we can see there's just a you know there's a lot <clears throat> a lot more going on here. There's a lot more banner grass in here, a lot more poplar. There's chirimoyas coming up, <clears throat> sugar canes, figs. Still, still quite a bit of gap, but uh, a lot a lot more dense. And then you know when we move on to the system that we planted yesterday, we can see how much more dense the planting is. You know we just got banner grasses all the way along here, and we are just chockered with uh, a whole bunch of stuff indigenous um, faux we've got um, indigenous berries we've got fig we've got mulberries we've got more figs we've got macadamias we've got tree tomatoes we've got cherimoyas we've got elderberries figs cherimoyas bananas and on both sides along here we've got planted underneath um, lots of uh, annual veggie seeds We've planted albizia seeds all the way, thousands all the way through the middle. I'm, I'm happy with thousands of albizias to come up. We'll probably only get hundreds. 
at the end of it, I'll probably cut them out so we just got 10. The density of the plant is just, just fantastic here, you know. Um, I think some of the questions we had yesterday is like, but, but there's too many plants, you know. Um, what we're doing is we're just planting enough in here to be able to select the ones that we want, the really healthy plants, the really vigorous plants. So we can chop out the ones we don't want, select for the ones we do want, and yeah, go with that. When you have good access to seeds and cuttings and propagation material where your trees aren't costing $65, $70 each, you can be way more liberal with how many you're putting in the ground because ultimately we planted what, maybe 15 macadamias in a almost 18 meter row. And the idea isn't that in 20 years we have 15 macadamias here, but the idea is that over time, a few of them will emerge as being really healthy, good genetics maybe of those. One of them will begin fruiting sooner than the others. It just gives you those opportunities to do genetic trialing, like Mark Shepard, right? But just a, a more diverse way of like just putting a ton of things in, seeing what works, seeing what doesn't. But the idea is we're not spending, the ultimate cost of this row was maybe like what, under a few hundred, under a few hundred dollars, fuel, um, the input of, of adding the mycorrhizal liquid, but ultimately a lot of this propagation material would have been the major cost, which was free because it's all already in the landscape in the local community, collect seeds, grow them, grow things from cuttings, easy, easy way of reducing cost in your food forest. Let's talk layout. First thing probably is easy to start off with is we've got the midline, right, where you can see maybe difficult because we've got all this mulch, but where we've got the bananas, we opted for bananas in the midline along with a huge diversity of tree seeds, a huge diversity of seedlings on that midline. Maybe about half a meter off the midline, would you say? Yeah. Half a meter off the midline, both uphill and downhill. Important note, this is pretty much on contour, maybe a little bit off, but it's more important that it's parallel to the next row up rather than it being perfectly on contour itself. So half a meter uphill and downhill from that midline, we've got bonagrass edges. These bonagrass are planted about one every 50 centimeters or so? Yeah, one every 50 centimeters. And in my experience, that's a fantastic density to get good shelter, produce ridiculous biomass, and keep any of the kaikuyu from creeping in. Now, we haven't just left kaikuyu paths in between though. What we've done, as you can see, we've planted Mexican sunflower stakes along the middle. Right. So the reason for having them switch like this, rather than, again, Mexican sunflower close to the midline, it's gonna require a lot more management. With management being one of the biggest limitations here, right? having a system where you can let it get a little bit more overgrown and not worry that your trees are gonna suffer, hugely important. Another idea for the management of this Mexican sunflower row was the opportunity to run the tractor through here. Is that right? Yeah, yeah so what we've got is we've got these, uh, these banners, this one and this one planted at uh, a distance of 1.2 meters. Uh, the tithonia is right in the middle, so theoretically I'll be able to back the tractor in here with the slasher blade, hitting the banner grasses and the tithonia all in one go, and just come back later and move all that to the sideline. Now that won't be my preference. My preference would be to do it by hand. Sharper blades, more learnings, ability to see what's happening, but with the scale and the amount of systems we have here, I like to be able to leave that option available that I can come in with the tractor and just smash it and move on to another system. One of the biggest limitations, I think, in a lot of people's mind is the scale at which you can do this work. And so having those backup opportunities where, hey, if things get overgrown, if suddenly the, the labor isn't there, we can just bring the tractor in and smash things out really quickly, even if it's not ideal biomass management, even if it's not ideal management of the actual plants themselves. Yeah. And uh, I, don't, I don't think we mentioned it, but the, yeah, this was planted straight into Kaikuyu. There's just Kaikuyu on both sides, so hence the Tithonia's in the middle as well will do the suppression of the, uh, of the um the kaikuyu, you know. And when we say planted straight into kaikuyu, obviously this midline of trees and annuals that went in and support plants on that middle row, that was tilled, right? That was, we used the rotary hoe on the back of the tractor to till that earth. We didn't just plant directly into the kaikuyu, but beyond that, the only edge suppression of, of kaikuyu to get in is from the bonagrass, Mexican sunflower, and just dumping all this organic material, which is cut grass, we've got leaves from the Abyssinian bananas and some comfrey as biomass for that initial mulch. Yeah, and I think that's, uh, that's quite an important point as well is that uh, we did bring in mulch 
initially and I think that's generally accepted in a syntropic system is that you bring in on your first on your first uh, um, biomass input is a is an imported mulch and uh, the design here is so that we won't have to do that again we've just got so much tithonia so much fine grass that really from now on all of the biomass will be coming from within a meter of each side of that tree line which is which is the way we want to go you know no imports just grow our uh, mulch on site and yeah and when he says the mulch was imported, he means the grass was cut from this field, brought in the banana leaves from the Abyssinian, yeah. cut from that Abyssinian banana over there. So it's not like it's not like we hired an arborist truck to drop a bunch of mulch off, but we did source mulch from around local systems. You can see there's a bunch of comfrey that was slashed just behind Sean. So you're right, you're not gonna be able to produce your immediate organic material for the system during the install, unless you're growing a cover crop, for example. If you grow a cover crop of lupins, you can cut them down, do your install and use that, which I've done before. But other than that, using grass management is one of your best ways of A, killing the grass beforehand, right? If you had time, if you had managed for the prior two years before this install, you just mulched and stacked grass on this tree line, you would end up with really nice, rich, soft soil conditions without really needing to do much tilling but that takes a lot more foresight and a lot more planning and deliberate management up until that point. Cool, let's go see some new systems. So we were just joking before that this whole thing is just a big advertisement for, hey, come come learn at Wilderland, come do some chop and drop, get some hands-on experience. So if you're interested, check that out. But we're also saying that one of the huge, one of the huge benefits of Wilderland, the history of having a 55, 56 year old established community, almost 60 years old, is that there's plenty of established fruit trees here. There's a huge, yeah. huge diversity of established fruit trees, which allows you to pull the propagation material. It allows you to get seeds, cuttings, the genetic material for new installs. Uh, in the back there, there's a, a fig, and we've got a, I think it's a Japanese walnut over there. And then we've got the Fijoas over here, a bit of indigenous, we've got guavas, we've got citrus, I think this is the tangelo, more guavas over here. Fijo is in the back there, Kawakawa, I see a peach tree back there. We've got um, avocado seedlings just coming up all over the place. Uh, another avo over here, and if we move around this way, we see the Japanese walnut. Uh, we see more avos, and we, we're going to head down there in between those Californian walnuts and see the next install that we, that we did, yeah. Cool. So the benefits of having established trees, immense. If you don't already have established trees, plant a food forest. But that's one of the beautiful things is like none of these trees were planted in a syntropic agroforestry way. They were just planted on their own and they're beautifully productive. You don't need to have trees in a syntropic system for them to be productive. But that's the fun thing is now there's a new flavor at Wilderland of syntropic food forest. And how many systems would you say you've installed in the last three years? There's, I mean, we've walked through a handful already. We've walked through, I mean, think since I've been here already six or seven. Yep. Yeah, that's probably probably about it. Yeah, some uh, some of them are uh, from scratch, uh, bare ground. Some of them uh, I've gone into a bit of um, overgrown acacia, fire damaged areas, and and gone in there and, and put the insoles in there. Others are retrofits in our tangella orchard, in our mac macadamia orchard. So yeah, we've a bunch of different things that we're trying out, seeing what works, what doesn't, and just making it work with what we've got already. Fantastic. So I'm already hearing a lot of different contexts for installation. You said we've retrofitted a market garden into a food forest, or into an agroforestry system, an orchard into an agroforestry system, bare land, bare flats, bare, this bare slope, previously degraded or previously impacted fire areas, just native bush that's, you know, early succession, turning that into agroforestry system. So you guys are really pioneering in a lot of different ways and seeing how to apply this agroforestry in a real way. It's, it's very inspirational. Yeah, and, and uh, I'm, I'm also looking at it in a way to see what the longer term benefits are other than a food forest. So I'm really, really hoping to install what we call the, the CCF, the Continuous Cover Forestry, which uh, when we're looking at you know 30 to 50 years, is we're getting specialized millable timber coming out of these areas where we've been growing and eating food from for the last 30 years you know and yeah, ending up with that as a as a final product beautiful but look what we got here 
<laughs> what have we got behind us? What have we got here? So yeah, this is uh, uh, two years ago, um, and we from what bare ground? From bare ground, yeah, bare ground. Two years ago, there were already the swales had been uh, put in place here. Uh, beforehand, people were trying to grow vegetables in this area. It's a northwest facing slope. Um, when you go and you will see how dry dry the earth is. There was just no success with, with the veggies. Um, it was far away from water. People were really struggling in here. I was like, great, let's stop that. Let's have a success, you know. So we planted full syntropic rows on the top. We had quite a lot of failure with the annuals, with a lot of the tithonias that we put in, or I can't remember actually when they weren't tithonia, but the support species because of its dry, arid, hot, environment but as you can see the bananas did really well and quite a lot of the support trees that we put in uh, the cherimoyas the inga beans the raisin tree uh, as you can see the albizias are popping up over there have done really well so i'm i'm not really sure what i'm going to do in the system next uh, you can see there's quite a big gap but once again in the stratas and uh, speaking to Byron earlier, we said maybe maybe a full reset is what's necessary, except of course for the longer lived trees. But yeah, maybe we do a reset. We've got incredible amounts of banana, biomass and mulch that we can use and maybe just do full installs again with all of that as the, as, as the base now, you know? And, yeah. There you go. That's the fun part about agroforestry. As you kind of go down the pathway, you realize, oh, I could have done this better. Cool. Do an intervention, reset it, add your things in. And it's more productive. Yeah. Let's go take a detailed walk. Yeah. Let's uh, let's actually let's just have a look at this quickly here. So you can see those. There's uh, one, two, three, four, five rows that were done uh, pretty much in the same time. And down here you can see the last two rows, which were just done in October, November. So yeah, we had a, a woman come in. Uh, she was here for maybe a month or so, six weeks or so, and she got really interested in the syntropics. And you know, I downloaded as much as I could, taught her as much as I could. And I just pretty much gave her these two rows to, to play with, and yeah, this is what we got. So it's, yeah, it's quite an interesting, interesting install. Um, Lots of Abyssinian bananas, Mexican yeah. sunflowers, yeah. and bana grass. Yeah, yeah, it's quite a, quite a bit in here. Um, we've got these these guavas already sitting on the edges, uh, with the annual beds in between, and um, yeah, inside here it's just yeah, it's just wonderful to see things that are coming up here, like this this chirimoya coming up here under this this cover so good size in there sugar canes are coming up uh, not sure what that is that's Jerusalem artichoke yeah we got fantastic yeah, yeah. Um, got mountain papayas coming up here uh, pomegranate got the spaghetti melon um, coming through there the abyssinian banana which definitely needs some chopping back the yakons in here abyssinians planted too close together great to see it uh, oh look sapote in there fantastic oh and a macadamia giant passion fruit coming through here oh, definitely did an, an intervention here don't we <laughs> um, yeah more yakons more pomegranates bananas uh, Tithonias, peach tree, Abyssinians, and right at the end, a Fijiwa. Well, great diversity of trees. All it would take is a little bit of time with a rice knife yeah. and a machete, yeah. and it'll be beautifully managed. Because those Abyssinian bananas, they're not edible flowers, and they're not edible bananas, but they're terribly productive yeah. for their biomass. Yeah. They do have quite a big footprint, yeah. so that's part of the management, but obviously that's taken into consideration. Yeah, and you can see the uh, <clears throat> self-seeded um, spaghetti melons coming up here. So getting them, getting them coming out with absolutely no work whatsoever. They're just growing there. And yeah, here we move into the system that's just a little bit older. Uh, and so this was part of your first batch of installations. Yeah. Right? You guys kind of had somebody come in who was like really an avid yeah. agroforester, stayed for a few weeks. Yeah, yeah, yeah that was Matt from... Uh, Purpose Dynamics, and he was well, he just came in here and yeah, he spent a month here and uh, or maybe a little bit longer and yeah, just gave us the syntropic seeds, you know, and yeah, we just we just took it and ran with it from there, yeah. So, um, this this was part of his influence, those those first uh, first rows up there, and this is a 
raisin tree he gave us, so I, mean, I don't know, that thing was about, about this big when we planted in there two years ago, so yeah, you can just see the growth on that, so that's, that's fantastic. We'll Wonderful. We'll put more of those in. Well, if he ever sees this, I'm sure he'll be happy to see the progress that's been made here. Yeah, totally, yeah. Thanks, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, so as we go into this system, uh, we can see quite clearly uh, the gap. Uh, look at this, I, mean, I, don't, I, don't, I don't even know what. I, you know, it's two years of Chirimoya growth. This is just this is just next level, you know. So yeah, yeah I mean, it's, just, it's just so beautiful. But yeah, we can see the gap here. Uh, we've got we've got quite high stuff and we've got low stuff, and we just got this gap in the middle, you know. So. What species are we talking about? We've pointed out the cherimoya, we've got the mountain papaya right there, which yep. is right there. We've got the bananas. We've seen some ice cream beans yep. around about there. head height. Yeah, there's one, one over here. Over here the bean. Yeah. There's a bunch of yakan, which you can see. It's kind of a ground cover. Not ground cover, but a herbaceous tuber. Yeah, it does very well in the shade, as you can see, so that's great. Um, yeah, I've, I've planted these uh, these Mexican sunflowers in here in the shade. They're not doing very well. They're, it's, it's pretty probably too late to put them in, you know. But put them in, see what happens. Um, yeah, I've got a couple of uh, drivers in here as well. The poplars, um, which also retrofitted in later. But yeah, I, I guess I guess yeah, we're missing this. We're missing this middle layer here. So um, perhaps some smaller fruit trees. You know, these are these are all going to be going to be quite quite big at the end of it. These will be uh, high to emergence, and yeah, I mean, I mean one of, one of the big things that that we haven't put in, which I think would be hugely beneficial for any system, is the tree tomatoes, the tamarillos. So yeah, just propagate as many of those as you can to, to get them in the system. You know, what what else are you reckoning for in between those those gaps? Yeah, I think you've nailed it. I think you've you've pointed out the early succession fruit trees. It's just a matter of those longer succession, medium to high canopy things. Which you, are, the thing is, you already have a lot of abundance of. You have a lot of citrus already. You could do with more mandarins, possibly. But it's, I mean, there's avocados coming out your ears here. There's loquats everywhere. There's guava everywhere. So, part of it is figuring out what you're missing in the landscape, and then just making it work in the system. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it. It is, it's actually a problem with us with how much fruit we have got. So it's one of the reasons I'm not planting some of the trees we've already got into our systems because already when the fruit comes on, it just comes on and you know, we're overwhelmed. We're like, man, this is a 12 hour day. It's just catching fruit and dehydrating it and turning it into, into products that are going to last us through the year or, or going to be sold in our shop. Um, I mean, it's so a, good, yeah. a good problem to have, but <laughs> I, I, I see what you mean. I see what you mean when it comes to designing new systems where you want there to be each niche is productive each strata but you've also got this thing as well we've already got tons of fruit trees what do we need yeah i think i, I think i joked with you earlier about the citrus being a weed at this stage so, <laughs> you know yeah great problems to have but yeah still still problems especially when you um you know when you're aware of food and the the, the, the food story around the world and just not wanting, not wanting to see it rot on the floor and just wanting to utilize it all you know and, and turn it into products that we can eat uh, so yeah that, that does become an issue then when there's just so much of it and like you know I'm, i just don't want to be planting any more so, because I just can't deal with it so yeah wow. and so what's what's the aim for you guys at wilderland here obviously there's a drive for food security but also a big part of it seems to be education and empowering people 100 percent, yeah so um yeah food security is a big one so uh i'm uh i'm really focusing on the perennial crops at the moment so really just trying to get the tattoos in uh, planting as many plantains as we can so you know which is which is an interesting <clears throat> thing because uh, from other parts of the world it's not plantains and misilukis and goldfingers it's it's green bananas and yellow bananas green bananas they cook yellow bananas they eat it they are you know so I'm like oh, yeah, maybe I'm focusing too much on plantains when just any of the green bananas are edible fry them up you know very very complex carbohydrates so yeah trying to trying to create that as a staple of the tattoos and then just doing uh, more crops of the annuals like the corns and the kumaras and potatoes and things like that you know but yeah i really i really want to create a base of perennial food that just takes minimal maintenance compared to an annual to produce food mm. um, and then yeah through that uh, inviting people to to come here to live and learn with us to experiment to play yeah, and just take that knowledge away with them to, to wherever they go and, and install it and spread it. 
wonderful because we never know where those ripple effects end up landing yeah, yeah, totally. and who they end up changing Thing. Do my hair while you're filming. Embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, so this is fantastic. I right? there's two years growth on the thing to be. That's just amazing. You know? Just coming over everything. Oh, what a pleasure. What a beautiful environment to be in. Eh? Another thing about this environment is I can work at midday. You know, I can't work in an annual garden at midday. There's just no way here. I can just be like doing my thing, protected from the sun. The comfort of the people who are doing the work is one of the big advantages of these agroforestry systems. Totally, yeah. yeah. Which comes down to so many different things like how you use your tools, how sharp your tools are, what type of tools you're using. Yeah, so yeah, it's all, all of those little bits just allow you to go longer, do more. And also you're creating these ecosystems. You know, you're not just tilling the soil, replace it, till the soil, pull it out, replace it, replant. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you, if you zoom the camera that way, and you see the open the open ground, I mean, you know, we're looking in two two or three years' time, that just being all of us just going that way, you know, around this amphitheater. So, yeah. so you're still expanding in a very real way. You're not slowing down. <laughs> Join us. <laughs> Join us, get planted. Yeah, come learn some tropic agroforestry at Wilderland in Coromandel. Yeah. Wonderful. Just walking through. One of the more established, older food forests here at Wilderland, and it's just incredible. We're surrounded in bananas, cherimoya, papaya, ice cream beans. There's these pie melons, these squash all over the place. And this ecosystem has developed on a really steep, dry, exposed slope in just two and a half years. Yep, yeah, just in two years. Yeah, I'm really struggling to grow anything before that, eh? and now you can just see. I mean, this. It's a no-brainer, it's just we can't stop the growth. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm looking at, up at bananas and plantains all over the place and you know, it seems really, really productive. Getting hungry. Let's go eat. <laughs> <laughs> Let's find some bananas. <laughs> yeah, you can kind of see the difference there on how angular and stubby they are. They're a good size, aren't they? Yeah. It's pretty, pretty chunky. Yeah, so <clears throat> just wanted to show the system here where we've got uh, all of these bananas uh, planted with some coffee below them and some inga beans. Uh, and obviously the pie melon just, just carrying around doing its thing. But I just wanted to show the difference here between these stems over here which we've planted below the deep litter chicken system compared to the rest of the stems on that side. The growth of these stems is just fantastic having this um, deep litter chicken system above it and I mean you can see that just pumping bananas out, I think you've seen some, some earlier there, uh, and just producing so much growth, so much green material. Um, yeah, so I, I just, you know, after seeing this I just fully recommend if you've got the opportunity to put your chickens next to and or above your bananas, uh, run your grey water through it, yeah, and just uh, try to stay on top of the, the abundance that's going to happen, man. It's like, <laughs> yeah, fantastic. So. You're saying these monstrous bananas right here, which, you know, these stems are gnarly. The fruit is going crazy, but these were all planted at the same time as those bananas down there, which are maybe... 25% of the size by the end of the row. Smaller bunches. Yeah, the impact of a chicken system for your bananas is immeasurable. Yeah, 100%. This is uh, holding the banana up. So, yeah. Fantastic. So, another trick, I think maybe we saw that earlier with the uh, bamboo as well. Yeah, just quite important to hold the banana stems up sometimes. Yeah. Wonderful. Incorporate your chicken coop with bananas on the downhill side. Yeah. 
So hopefully that was interesting for you guys, walking through those different systems, checking out the install, and just seeing everything that Wilderland has to offer. Now, if anybody has any questions or if they want to come experience some of these systems and get some hands-on, what do you say to them? Yeah, for sure. Uh, join us. We've got we've got so many different ways to be here. Uh, we've got you, you. You can come for a night. You can come for a week. Uh, you can come for a lifetime. You know, we've got we've got volunteer positions. We've got rental positions. We've got staff positions. Yeah. Um, come come and live and learn. Come and come and experience. Come and experiment. Come and play. You know, that's that, that's what we're here for. Um, trust owned land. So everything you do is you just you're just paying it forward. Um, this this land is for the people of New Zealand. So. Yeah, come and enjoy it and come and learn and come and join us and get stuck in. It seems like a fantastic opportunity for people to learn and develop themselves and develop the skills that they might need if they're curious about off-grid living, yep. a place to practice. Yep. Yeah, it's not, it's not only Centropy, it's off-grid living, it's uh, uh, business, it's uh, understanding yourself, it's how, understanding how to live with other people. We're practicing MBC, we're, um, you know, we, we're diving into deeper systems of how to cooperatively manage things. Yeah, there's, there's so, so much learn, learn, to learn here. Such a growth edge. Yeah, it's, a, it's just a fantastic opportunity for, for those that are, that are willing to just try something different, step out of the normal society and yeah. Fantastic. Well, if you guys are on the fence, if you're in the Coromandel, you want to come see some cool Centropic Agroforestry, if you want to come meet Sean, if you want to come see all the amazing things that they're doing here beside that, the beekeeping, there's so many different things. Check Boulderland out. You can find them, link all the pages below. Hope it was interesting. See you guys later. Fucking perfect timing because that SD just, card just... just...